right, good morning. Welcome to those of you that are here in Phoenix. Um, We're glad you're with us. If you are new, we are exceptionally glad that you're with us today. If you are watching us any way you found us, which if you don't know this, you don't have to actually be here, you can watch us online at womensbiblestudy.com. You can download our apps. We have an Android and Apple Windows app. Um, Just search your app store for Women's Bible Study. We're always the bright pink box. Uh, What else do we have? We have Roku, YouTube. Uh, People watch us from Apple TV. So any way you found us, we're glad that you are joining us today. Now, if you want to know more about our Women's Bible Study, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. We have handouts for today's lesson, and you can download that and follow along with us. So it was so funny last week. Like, we put these two stages together, and there's this hole right here. Yeah, last week in our Revelation series, I literally stepped in there. (laughs) My shoe came off. That was one of those really awesome moments in my life, but whatever. All right, here's what happens. If you're new today, we began a series in the book of Acts about two years ago. We made it to Acts chapter 5, and then we took an entire fall and spring series and two summers, and we, we did something completely different. And so we're picking back up in our series, Why Did God Save Me? Why Is This Not Straight? would be the question. Because I know some of you are looking at it and you're just like, oh, it's going to bug me the whole time. Is it all okay up there? Okay, good. We're good to go. Okay, so what we're doing is we're trying to catch everyone up to where, and next week we're actually going to pick up where we left off in Acts 5. But I want to try to catch you up on where the disciples are at this particular point in their life, like as far as uh, what's going on in their mind and their thought process and what's changed in their life. And so today we're going to talk about something that was really important to them and should be really important to us, and that would be the Holy Spirit. And the question that we're going to ask today for each one of you is, who is running your life? And that's going to be our main focus for today. Now, as we begin, I want you to know that where we are in Acts, if you've never read the Bible before, um, of course, we told you last week that Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and also the sequel to that, which is Acts. And what you need to know is that in history, Acts is this transition period from what used to be to what is now. And what that means is that, especially in regards to the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit, you see him show up in the Old Testament, let's say, or before Pentecost, he would rest upon people. Like he would rest on Moses and give Moses the power to do what needed to be done. He would rest on David or King Saul or, or he would come, he would rest on people for specific tasks. But what we see in Acts is something brand new, something that has never happened before, and it is going to be a life changer, not only for the disciples, but for you and I too. Now, here's what we want to talk about is that when a person gives their life to Jesus, and I want to really, really clarify this, I don't mean when you joined a church or when you became religious or joined a religion or signed up for whatever, and we're not talking about that. We're talking about someone who is born again, who gives their life to Jesus and devotes their life to him like the disciples did at that particular time. What happens now is that the Holy Spirit doesn't just come upon you. He, he dwells within you. I was going to bring a, 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 like a baggie, and it's like the Holy Spirit comes in, and you know the baggies that seal? You're sealed. He's, he's going to be in you forever and ever and ever. He's never going to leave you. But now his job is going to be to work things out of your life. So this would be completely different and completely new for the disciples if you really think about what they went through. They had Jesus with them. Jesus was like their own personal Holy Spirit because he walked with them and talked with them and and he answered all their questions and he healed the blind and raised the dead. And if you were there and you had a dog and let's say your dog died, you could go to Jesus and say, hey, could you raise my dog from the dead? And he'd be like, absolutely. But if you had a cat... (laughs) You'd say, Jesus, could you raise my cat from the dead? And he'd be like, no, but I'll help you bury it. No, okay. <laughs> Cats terrify me. I only say that because of that. But anyway, that's, that's what was going on at that particular time. Like Jesus was with them and Jesus could do all of these things for them. And they were perfectly happy to just have things the way it were. And then Jesus sits them down one time in John 16, 7 and says this. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. 
Jesus comes along and said, it is to your advantage. It would be better for me to go away and to send the Holy Spirit. And they had no idea what that meant. Like if you put it in their minds, they, they, this is so unimaginable to them. But after Jesus tells them this, then it even gets worse. Jesus gets arrested and he gets flogged and crucified on a cross and dies and is now just, you know, stuck in a tomb. And they're just confused. They're like, I have no idea now what's supposed to happen. But then Jesus rises from the dead and spends 40 days with all of these guys explaining to them the importance of what they need, the message that they need to get out into the world. And how in the world would they do it? And the answer is going to be all day, the Holy Spirit. Because something new is about ready to happen. Before Jesus ascends into heaven, Acts 1.8 says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Paul goes on in 2 Timothy 1.14 to say this, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And then 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? So see, something new is about ready to happen and it's going to be a game changer. Because now that the Holy Spirit will indwell a believer, here's our next screen, this is what's going to happen. They would have the power to live and work for God in the place that God called them. Which is what Acts is all about. It's showing us what you and I are supposed to do as followers of Christ. It, it means that you will have the power now to, to share Christ, to love people, to forgive people in your place where God has called you, your neighborhood, your Zumba class, your retirement community, your mom's group, your school, your high school, your college, wherever God has placed you. Now he wants to use you at that point. Now, we're making two points. Last week we made one. We'll make the second one today. Here was last week's point up on the screen. God saved us to get the message of Jesus out into the world. So we did this whole lesson on why in the world, which is why we call it, why did God save me? And God saved us so that we could go out and, and tell people about this great news about Jesus. And, and we talked last week about, I don't think many people are doing that. And, and I don't think that they are doing it because they don't know why God saved them. We, I, we said this last week. Most people think God saved us just so we can be healthy and wealthy and happy and all those kind of things. They don't realize that God saved us for a purpose, and that's to get the gospel out. So point two for that is we need to know that. And here's point two, that we don't know the power that's available to us to do great things for God. And because we don't know this power that the Holy Spirit living within us can produce in us, we are absolutely bored with our Christian life. And I think if you ask most Christians, they would say, you would say, hey, do you live a, a vibrant, exciting Christian life? They would say, no, I'm bored to tears. Because you just show up on church on Sunday and you show up here on Wednesday, but nothing goes on in the week and you're not doing anything. And just When people are bored, what do they do? They just sit in front of the TV all day long and do nothing. And we do the same thing in our faith. Larry Walters was a 33-year-old man who decided he wanted to do something. So he wanted to see his neighborhood from a different perspective. So he went to the local army surplus store. He bought 45 used weather balloons. And he got a lawn chair. He tied the balloons to his lawn chair. He took a BB gun, knowing when he got 100 feet into the air, he'd just shoot the balloons out and come back down. He had a peanut butter jelly sandwich, a six-pack of beer, and this was his plan because he wanted, he was just tired of just not doing anything. So he has his friends clip the little cords to the balloon, and he soared 11,000 feet into the sky. Okay, could you imagine in a lawn chair? <laughs> I would be like a panic stric. I would be just a mess. But anyway, it's right in, in the air traffic pattern in the Los Angeles International Airport. So everything shuts down because they're like, what is this? And so all, you know, no flights were leaving. It was a mess. Anyway, by the time he gets to the ground, he gets a ticket, of course. And, but they ask him, um, some people went to him and said, all right, tell me, ask, answer these questions. Were you scared? And he was like, uh, yeah. Would you do this again? Uh, no. And the third question was, why did you do it? And he said, because you can't just sit around and do nothing all day long. And at least he got up and did something. And, and, I was, and, and there's something in there for us. But I think most Christians are sitting around doing nothing and saying to themselves, there has to be more to my Christian life than this. There has to be more to it. 
And I get that. And most of you, if you've been here, you know my story. I told you my turning point in my life was at 51st Avenue and Thunderbird, driving down the road, stoplight, said, all of a sudden this thought came in my brain that says, I don't even know why I'm a Christian. It hasn't changed me. I'm not doing anything. I'm no different than my non-Christian friend. Like, what's the problem? So I took a drive to the Christian bookstore and picked up Chuck Swindoll's book on the life of David. I know I've told you this story a million times, but it was so impactful in my life at that time. And I opened the book of David and I was starting to read it and I was like, I, I get for the first time, and I don't know why it was the first time, that God was intricately involved in David's life and had this purpose for David. And it wasn't for David just to be king. It was for David to be king and somehow share God with other people. And this was his job. And because of that, David had this vibrant life. And, and I thought, okay, that's what I'm missing. So I went back to the Christian bookstore, went and picked up another book called Chuck Swindoll's book uh, called Living on the Ragged Edge. And in there, it was all about Ecclesiastes. And, and there was one verse in there that changed my life for good. It changed the whole trajectory of my life. And the question was answered, why am I bored with my Christian life? And the answer was one random verse in Ecclesiastes that said this, because you're living under the sun, under the sun. And you need to be living under the sun, over the sun. And it was so random and so weird. And it was like God just took the blinders off my life. And I realized for the first time that I am living my Christian life under the sun, under the actual literal sun, but I'm living it for what goes on down here under the sun. What can make me happy and what's, you know, what's going to satisfy me for today and all this. And the reason why I don't, wasn't living a great Christian satisfied life is because I was not living under the sun with everything having to do with above the sun, which is God. Everything I did was for me. And I was never going to live a, a, the right Christian life until everything I did was for God. And I realized that day. But when I realized that, I understood like what, what was going to happen next. How could I do that? Because at this particular time in my life, I'm not like I am today. Like if you would have said, hey, get up and share Jesus, I'd be like, I'm, sh I'm scared, I'm, I'm terrified, I'm like, I'm not going to do that, I'm frightened, like I don't want people to think I'm a Jesus freak, like they're going to think I'm so weird, and that's where I was. But we get the answer in Acts that we learn from the disciples what changes is the Holy Spirit. And when you understand that the Holy Spirit lives within you and will give you the power and the courage and the boldness and anything you need, it will change your Christian life. So reviewing where we were, Jesus ascends into heaven. He tells his disciples um, to wait for the power, wait for what he, the, Jesus had told them. I'm leaving and the helper's coming. So you go to Jerusalem and you wait. So they're waiting and waiting and waiting. And we know it is Pentecost where the, the Holy Spirit comes in as a rushing wind. People are speaking in tongues. They're speaking in different languages. Like, and suddenly everything's changed. And the reason we know it's changed is because we see Peter and Peter stands up in front of thousands of people and starts preaching the gospel and telling all these Jewish people and all these Romans that are listening, you need Jesus. Read the Torah. Read your scriptures. Like, trust me, he's prophesied throughout the whole Old Testament. And you need Jesus. He, he's the prophesied Messiah. And in that day and age, that was really, really bold. And we say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Peter? Here's our picture of Peter. Peter, that Peter? <laughs> that, that was the Peter we remembered in, in the Gospels. He's like hiding. He's terrified. He's like, I don't want to be crucified on a cross, so I'm going to hide. I'm going to pretend like I don't know, know Jesus. He denied Jesus three times. And think of that. They were so afraid because they knew they might be next. They just saw Jesus crucified on a cross. They're like, that's not how I really envisioned my death. And so they were very, very frightened at that time. Rome was ruling. They didn't want, you know, this whole Jesus movement, this, the way is what it was called. Um, this was something new, and Rome would have quenched it, and they would have done it by putting all these guys to death. But here we see Peter standing up and saying, I don't even care anymore. What happened? Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. And now he is changed completely because something is going on inside of him where now he's like, you know what? I'm so not afraid of you. I don't care what you think of me. I just need desperately for you to know about Jesus. And if you know what? The Romans come in and put me on a cross, whatevs. If someone doesn't like me, whatever. 
I mean, that, you don't care anymore. When you start living your life under the sun, above the sun, caring more about the things of God than you do yourself, I'm telling you what, you will have the most exciting Christian life in the entire world. That's just what happens. There's a story of a very rich guy who threw a party at his mansion. One of his pride and joys was a saltwater, big, huge pool. And he always kept various species of ocean fish in there. So he had this big party, and he had everyone assemble around the side, and he put into his pool his collection of great white sharks. And he told his guests, he said, if anybody can swim from that end to that end with the sharks and makes it out, he said, I'll give them a million dollars. And he said, suddenly I heard a splash. And he said, all of a sudden, this guy's just swimming, 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 gets to the other end, jumps out. And the, the rich guy came over and said, congratulations, that was very brave. And the swimmer said, I just have one question. Who pushed me? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Last week, I had people come up to me afterwards and said, I still do not get your joke that you told. And I'm like, do you want me to explain it to you? And they're like, nope, I don't even want to know anymore. So... Yay, I finally found a joke. Okay, but here's the deal. Um, the Holy Spirit in Peter's life is kind of like that. There was nobody pushing him, per se, into the, uh, this pool with all the great sharks. Peter now, filled with the Holy Spirit, would be jumping in the water, saying, I, I just know that God is going to take care of me if he wants me to live. If he wants me to die, I die. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's what happens when you live your life under the sun, above the sun. And here's a picture of what Peter was doing next. I mean, that's not it, but kind of like it. He's preaching. He goes from that guy hiding in the closet to this. And that's because the Holy Spirit came into his life and gave him purpose Christians are lacking purpose today, power and boldness. And here's what you need to know. The same Holy Spirit lives in you and me if you are a follower of Jesus. And I did not understand that, which is why the next screen, which is why I was living a purposeless, boring Christian life. And so today I want to talk about the Holy Spirit because I think most of us are confused. And if we're confused about the Holy Spirit, we're going to be completely confused about our Christian life. Now, what I want to do is I'm, I need you guys to be able to see this and we'll kind of go. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, here's the problem. All of you go to different churches. Some of you go to very charismatic churches. Some of you go to very Bible churches. And so the, the Holy Spirit is just confusing to most people. So I want to show you this whole spectrum of what this looks like. And it really, like I said, depends on what church you were raised with. And you can see where you fit in here. If you are very, very far to the left over here, I don't know if you guys can see this over here. There's a group called the cessationists. We're going to stick this over here and see if I don't fall out. Okay, there you go. That's on the very far end over here. Now, if you go to a church like that or if you um, are like that, that just means that it's somebody who doesn't believe acts happens today. And in other words, there's no healing, there's no speaking in tongues, there's no miracles, there's none of that. That was relegated to this one time period over here in Acts. And that's what, that's all the way to that that, that way in that direction. On the whole other end of the spectrum over here, we have what we call sensationalists. We'll put them over here. Sensationalist is somebody, some of you probably know some of these people, they're all about the Holy Spirit. In fact, you don't even hear much about Jesus, but you hear things like, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Have you, as, a, as a Holy Spirit, have you, you know, spoken in tongues? Have you, have you been slain in the Spirit? Have you, like, but, it, but it's not just speaking in tongues. I'm tell, that is a spiritual gift, so don't hear me when I say that that's not. Some people do. But there's this extreme over here where it's all about that. I have people come to me and they'll walk up and they'll be like, so Lisa, do you speak in tongues? And I'm like, you know, I don't. I said, it's not a gift God has ever given me. Here's the look. And then they walk away. And I walk away thinking, okay, what am I missing? Like, do I, but they make you feel like you're this less than Christian, like you don't have the fullness of God. And I'm like, I'm sorry, the Bible doesn't say that, so we're not even going there. But it's people that all it is is about the Holy Spirit. And like I said, they have these weird groups where they laugh like hyenas and they bark like dogs and they roll around on the ground. And this is a real thing. And that's what's so scary. So you have this two huge spectrums over here where, where you're one, you, you, somewhere we're all in the, in the middle. The next uh, person I want to tell you about is probably where I land. And I'm over here. These are Bible people, OK? 
okay. I love this picture of that kid. He's so cute. They're Bible people. Some of you are like this. Now, Bible people, as the reason why I say I'm more like that is because if I want to know, if I want God to speak to me, I'm going to open my Bible. I'm going to say, all right, God, I need you to speak to me through the word. And that's mostly because I need things in black and white. It is probably because I do what I do here. I need to see it. I don't need to, like, feel something. I'm not emotional. I'm kind of one of those people that I need to see it black and white. Because um, I, I, if, if I, all of a sudden I was like, oh, I think God just spoke to me, I wouldn't know for sure if it was God because it's not written in front of me. Now, I'm not saying that this part of it's bad, but I'm just saying that's just me. That's what Bible people are. I think Bible people are probably less emotional too. I, I was thinking about this. Um, we didn't have much to watch this summer, so I think I told you we, we watched Hallmark movies. So I always thought Hallmark was just Christmas. It's not. It's all year long, okay, which that was news to me. So we've been having so much fun. But my husband, for those of you that know Rob, he's so sweet, and he's just so tender, and I'm just not like that. I like, I'm just kind of more like, yeah, I get over it kind of a person. So anyway... We're watching Hallmark, and of course, you know, they get together at the end, and it's a beautiful story, and I look over at Rob, and he's got like tears. It's the sweetest thing ever. And then he looks at me, and he goes, does that even not move you? And I said, you know, I'm kind of more a realist. I said, they're going to be divorced in a year, okay? <laughs> and he's like, wow, okay, that's awesome, Lisa. But I'm not just, I'm not real like lovey-dovey and, and romantic, I'm like, ah, whatever. We went to Mexico. Um, that's why I didn't lose weight. So I'm, now, it's, now it's the Mexico trip. So it's always someone's fault and it's never mine. Um, but we go to Mexico because someone told us about this all-inclusive place. We've never been to one before. So we went there. I can't remember if I told you this last week. So I told you that's where I'm starting. I can't remember if I told you this last week. See, I didn't tell you. Okay. So in August, August was my diet month. Okay. Didn't happen because in August we went to Mexico. All-inclusive, which means what? I can eat anything I want, and it's free. It was the coolest thing. So we wake up in the morning, we go to breakfast. They won my heart at chocolate, Nutella, banana, strawberry, crepes every morning. That's how I started out. And then two hours later, you're like, oh, I'm sure it's lunchtime. And so you could get you know, chips and guacamole, and you know, you're in Mexico. You, can, you need to eat that. And then, of course, you had to have dinner. And then they don't have Dr. Pepper, but what do they have? Coke. Mexican Coke. There was nothing better than that because I think they use real sugar is kind of what the deal is. Anyway, so we get to this place, and Rob's so sweet. And he gets to the front desk, and he said, could we upgrade our room? And I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. As long as I get a bigger bathtub, I'm fine. But anyway, he goes, they go, well, we have the honeymoon suite available. And he's like, we'll take it. And I'm thinking, oh, for the love. <laughs> Okay, honeymoons are exhausting. I'm just like, I'm way too old to do the honeymoon thing again. So I want the room, but I don't know what, what, what has to go on in the room. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I'm poor Rob. But anyway, but he's just so incredibly sweet like that. And that's just like him. But I'm just kind of like, a, uh, you know, anyway. That's Bible people. I don't know how I got off on that tangent, but that's kind of Bible people. They're just not real emotional. They're just kind of big on just setting the word and getting it out there. And that's not a lot of emotions. Now, the third, the last people here are what we're going to call spirit people. Now, these are people who go to, you know, Pentecostal churches, uh, uh, charismatic churches, whatever. And they, they're, and th that's fine. Like, it's like they speak in tongues and people prophesy over them. And, but this particular group is more like they're going to be less Bible and more feeling. And they want you to, uh, you know, pray a word over them or give them a word or prophesy over them. Or it, it's more of what's in my head and what is God speaking to me than it is opening the word. Now, there's variations here. So if, don't come up to me afterwards and say, well, I'm this and I'm that and I'm in the point. Ah. Okay, you get where I'm going here. Here's my point. Skip Heidzik says this. This is why it's important about the Holy Spirit. Uh, next screen here. If you are Bible only, you will dry up. And I get that. If you are spirit only, you will blow up. If you are both Bible and spirit, you will grow up. And I think that's the point that we're trying to get to today, is that I want us to be Bible and spirit. I don't want us to be so Bible that we just, we miss the spirit of God working within our and changing us inside. And we don't want to be so spirit that we have no Bible and we're just all over the board and we just can't seem to figure things out. So that's where it's at. So I want to make sure that we are, when, we, when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we understand that, that there's this middle ground here. It's the, it's the both and. It's not these weird extremes. So 
what did the, the disciples' life look like back then when they, were, uh, when they first realized this? The Holy Spirit comes in their life, and we want to learn some lessons from them. So here's what I want to talk about. We went to Mexico. Apparently, we went to Mexico a lot. Um, at the beginning of the summer, I'm taking this down because I have to show you this back thing here. We went to um, Mexico. We met these people. And he asked what, what I was teaching, and I said, oh, we're teaching Acts. And we got on this subject about uh, your flesh and your spirit. And I realized that this had to be one of our lessons. I'm going to throw those over there, see what happens to that. Okay. You're not going to be able to see this very well over there, I don't think. So I'm going to move this back and see, how, see what happens. Here's what it is. We have this Dell computer here. Now, I am going to say the Dell computer is our flesh. Okay, I'm going to mush this over here. I was worried this morning that it was going to be off, and then you OCD people will be all freaked out. Okay, so this is your flesh, so we're going to compare these two. The Dell computer is like your flesh. He explained it like this. There's two operating systems. Each computer has its own. My Apple computer has a different operating system than the Dell PC. I was always had a PC. Someone said, you get an Apple. I'm like, I have no idea how to do it. It's opposite. It was confusing. I finally figured it out. But for the sake of this illustration, this is what we're going to say. This computer is the operating system with your flesh. Now, when you are born, you are born with a, a flesh. Now, here's what the flesh does. It does this. If someone hurts you, you're angry with them. That's the flesh. If someone makes you mad or says something about you, then you go gossip about them. That's your flesh. If, you're, if you weren't going to be friends with that person and not me, I'm going to be jealous and angry. That's the flesh. I'm bored, so I'm going to go get drunk. That's the flesh. I, I'm lonely, so I'm going to go sleep with that guy. That's the flesh. I, I don't like my husband, so I'm going to go have an affair. Do you see what I'm saying? So these are flesh things that we're born with in our life, and that is what operates our life. That's the operating system of our life. But then when you become a Christian, i got to do this so I don't fall and kill myself up here. Then what happens when you become a Christian? Guess what happens? Spirit. That's going to annoy me, isn't it? Okay, we're, you just see me, I had to bend over today, and I could hardly get up. And I said, yep, that's what happens when your pants are too tight. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Okay, so here's our systems here. So you have the, the, the flesh, which is in you, and now you have the spirit. When you become a Christian, the spirit of God now moves in your life. So now you have two operating systems in your life. Now, the Holy Spirit's job is to do this on our next screen. Uh, the removing, uh, there you go. The Holy Spirit's job is to be removing flesh attitudes and actions and replacing them with spirit attitudes and actions. And I want to show you how this worked in the Bible. It happened all through the Bible. For instance, John, the Apostle John, hung out with Jesus, probably Jesus' very best friend. When John and his brother James and Jesus, they were walking along and they were going into Samaria, and the Samaritans wouldn't let him in. And John and his brother James were furious. And they were just like, Jesus, you need to rain down fire on them and kill them all. This is John. That's a fleshly deal. Like, kill them all. We hate them. That's flesh running. Now, in 90 AD, so by this time, John is probably, I don't know, 70, he writes the book of 1 John. And he would never consider telling God to rain down on anyone. His whole book is about love. Love people. They'll know you're a Christian by your love. If you don't love, you might not even be a Christian. Like his whole life changed. And the reason why it changed is because his operating system changed. He took the flesh and said, I don't want the flesh running my life anymore. I want the operating system of my life to be the spirit. We see it in Peter. We just saw it. Peter's hiding in a closet. And then the Spirit of God comes in, and those were flesh. I'm scared. I'm frightened. I, I don't want, you know, I don't want to get hurt. And then the Spirit of God comes in and starts running his life, and it gives him boldness and courage. What changed? His operating system in his life. Here's our next screen. The Holy Spirit took over and moved the flesh out of the way. Here's what should happen. This should become less and less. And the spirit should become more and more. Now, we're always going to have some of this. Just an FYI on that. I'll tell you why that is. But this is how it should look. If your life is all flesh, no spirit, there might be a problem. 
Because when you become a Christian, the Spirit of God moves into your life. But here's what happens is these two operating systems are constantly fighting all day long. But we want to get to the point where we want the Spirit of God. Here's our next question right here. What dominates my life? The Spirit, the flesh or the Spirit? And it's a starting point for all of us. We need to look within ourselves and say, what is running my, if flesh is running me, are you bitter? Are you angry? Are you unforgiving? Are you a witch to your husband? Like, are you angry? Are you frustrated all the time? Are you, do you drink too much? Do you hate people? Are you always anxious? Like, these are things that come out of the flesh. And God says, wait a minute, a follower of Jesus does not have to live by an operating system of the flesh anymore. I want to take control. And I want to make that anger not angry anymore. And I want to make that bitterness into love and that hatred into love. And, and I want to change everything in your life. But it all becomes a starting point when you and I say, what is wrong with me? What is going on? I say I'm a Christian, but I'm clearly not acting like one. So God, what is it that needs to change in my life? I realized this. This was me this morning. Not this morning, a couple months ago. Here was me. Okay, this is how I woke up in the flesh. We always get up so early, so my whole goal is on Saturday to sleep at least till 6, okay? That not, never happens, but that was my goal for this particular time. So what happened was, at 5.10, Rob came in because he'd gotten up early, went and got coffee, came back and woke me up at 5.10. And he says, I need you to help me get this forklift. I need you to drive me down to get it and then follow me back. Forklifts go about five miles an hour. So we're talking like an hour, hour and a half project. So I wake up and my first thoughts were not like, I would love to help you. Okay, I'm telling you what, my flesh I, that's what was running my life that morning. And I woke up and I'm so annoyed with him. I'm like, serious? Like, it's 5.10. Did you not get the memo that we're supposed to sleep in until 6? And this is ridiculous. What do you mean we have to go? Like, this is just stupid. So I was just whining and carrying on and blah, blah, blah. So as I'm driving back, I realized, and I said, God, I have the worst attitude. And I am running my life by my flesh. And I recognize it. That's the first thing. Recognize it. And I said, God, here's the deal. You need to... Take over and make my flesh less. That's what needs to happen here. And so we got home, and I went into work on Bible study stuff. And when I do, I kind of get in the zone, and it's like if the phone rings, it freaks me out. And so two hours later, the phone rings, and it's Rob. He's out of the barn. And he said, Lisa, the forklift got stuck. And he said, I really need your help. But it was so cool because I prayed about it, and I knew I had a bad attitude. And you know what exuded out of my heart? truly was, I would love to help you. What can I do? Went out, helped him with stuff, and because that's what I needed to do. I, I prayed about it. I recognized it, and I said, God, I want you to take over. And if we pray about it, he will. And your attitudes will start changing. You'll be like, what do you mean I just told my husband I loved him? What do you mean I just was kind to him and I spoke kindly instead of like a jerk? Like when we realize that, that we realize there's these two operating systems in our life. What the Spirit means is waking up saying this on our next screen. God, I am giving control of my life over to you. So help me to live a life that pleases you. I don't want to operate out of the flesh. I want to operate out of the Spirit. Here's some verses. Romans 8, 5 says this. For those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires, sets their minds and pursues those things which gratify the flesh, so see what it says, if you are a person that's, that's, that's living out of your flesh, it's all because you're living for desires that are going to make you happy. It's all about you. But those who are according to the Spirit are controlled by the desires of the Spirit. They set their minds on and seek those things which gratify the Holy Spirit. See the difference? It's just like that under the sun, over the sun thing. What are we looking to live for and about? Me or God? And, and that's, what, that's what happens here in our, in our systems. So let's look at the next screen, which says what? Flesh? It's a big thing. So let's look and see what our flesh is. Galatians 5.16 says this. But I say, walk habitually in the Holy Spirit, seek him and be responsive to his guidance, and then you will certainly not carry out the desire of the sinful nature, which responds impulsively without regard for God and his precepts. Isn't that interesting? We pop off and we say things and we do things without any regard uh, for, for God. 
For the sinful nature has its desire, which is opposed to the spirit. There you go. They're, they're in your life, and they're both opposing one another. Um, and the desire of the spirit opposes the sinful nature. For these two, the sinful nature and the spirit are direct opposition to each other, continually in conflict, so that you as believers do not always do whatever good things you want to do. But if you are guided and led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. And then he goes and explains what the practices are of someone who's living in the flesh. He says, now the practices are evident. Sexual immorality, which could mean anything. It could be you're sleeping around. It could be your lifestyle that you've chosen that does not go with what God has, has ordained for you. Um, impurity, sensuality, total irresponsibility, lack of self-control, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, strife. Look at your homes. Is there strife in your home? Um, uh, jealousy, are you jealous all the time? Fits of anger, do you scream and yell? Disputes, dissensions, factions that promote heresies, envy, drunkenness, riotous behavior, and other things like these. I warn you beforehand, just as I did previously, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what that means is, if you're angry, that doesn't mean that you're not going to go to heaven. That just says that if you can live a continual, continual, with no conviction of the Holy Spirit, and a life of any one of those things, and not feel the Spirit of God saying, you can't do that. That's not what a child of mine is supposed to act like. Um, then you need to, I hate this computer, that's why I got a new one. It hates me. That's why, that, that's what happens in the flesh. Now, here's the next one, the Spirit. Here's what it looks like if you are living in the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is about this. The result of His presence within us. I love the Amplified, how they did that. Is love. Look at that. What is love? This, this passage is like so, we get so tired of it. Love. It's unselfish concern for others. Do you care more for your husband, your child, your neighbor, your friend than you do yourself? And that's something that happens when the Spirit is controlling your life. Joy, which is inner peace. Some of you are so up and down because of circumstances. I, 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 my sweet friend Vicki over here, like she just was in the hospital. She just found out her, her um, brother just died. And she's here and she's joyful. And the circumstances are horrible. And they've been horrible. But she has this joy about her and, and you hear her singing and it doesn't really matter because she's living under the sun above the sun. And there's just something about that when that happens. Peace. Some of you are so anxious, the Spirit of God will provide peace when you get who he really is. Uh, where are we? Joy, peace, patience. Not the ability to wait, but how we act while we're waiting. I like that. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, there you go, the sinful nature with its passions and appetites. If we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Spirit with personal integrity, godly character, moral courage, our conduct empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is what you need to know. Living, walking by the Spirit is this day-to-day -day process. Some days you're going to have more flesh. Some day you're going to have more Spirit. The goal is to make the flesh leave and the Spirit take over. That's pretty much the goal. But we'll have mishaps, like I do quite a bit. My dad was in the hospital this summer. Um, and just, just for a couple days, and something had happened, and he, he was, anyway. He went back in the hospital. I went to church on Sunday, went to see him in the hospital. Walk in, my mom's just kind of distraught because this hospital won't help anyone. Like, they won't come in and tell you what's going on. My mom has no idea what's happening. They've been waiting for the cardiologist. He just showed up just before I got there. My mom comes in, I come in, and she said, they were so mean, this cardiologist, he was one on call, was so condescending. And every time I'd ask him a question, he'd say, I already answered that. I already answered that. Okay, this is my mom and dad. And so I'm telling you what, there was not one ounce of this going on. All right, that, that was shut. And I was on a rampage. And I walked out to that nurse's station. I'm like, I need to speak to my parents' nurse. Well, she was on the phone. I need to talk to her the minute she gets off the phone. And I just went nuts. And anyway, I come back in, and I'm ranting and raving. This is a ridiculous hospital, and I can't believe these people. And I, you know, my dad looks at me, and he goes, Honey, did you go to church this morning? <laughs> and I laugh because I'm like, Well, it doesn't quite look like it, does it? But I was operating out of my flesh and not out of my spirit. 
So as I was leaving, the nurse that I wanted to talk to was finally off the phone, and she came around the corner just as I did. So I stopped her, and I told her how I felt about the hospital. I was nice, but I said, this is ridiculous. That cardiologist needs to be fired. I don't even know who he is, but it's, we're, this is ridiculous. And I just went on and on. Then I went in and talked to my mom afterwards, and she laughed, and she said, honey, she said, I saw you talking to the nurse, and I thought you were either sharing Jesus with her, or you were telling her how much you hated the hospital. And I said, well, mom, this nurse would never even suspect I was a Christian, okay? Because why? I was living out of my flesh. Where's my glove? I had this cool little glove. I went, oh, here is this. See, that's my brain. Here it is. Okay, this is why. Every day you and I have to decide what operating system. This is what I was thinking. It's like this. When you and I become a Christian, here's the Holy Spirit. Ah! Okay, comes in your life, and this is you. Okay, here's the problem. Now he's in there, but we walk around in, like this. We walk around in the flesh all day long. Okay, I even wrote attitudes, how we talk, how we think, actions. And we just say what we want, act how we want. Say, blah, blah, blah. And the Holy Spirit's like, stop it. I want to come in your life. Okay, if I can do this. There. That's what a, a, a life looks like, where the Holy Spirit is now running how you talk, how you act, what you say, all those things. And this is the goal for us as Christians, to live this kind of life. Now, the funny thing about the hospital episode is that never once did I say, Dear Jesus, I have a really bad attitude. Would you give me love for the nurse and the doctor? Because honestly, living in the flesh is so fun. Like, if, if we're going to be truthful about this, sin's fun, the flesh is fun. It just is. It's way more fun to yell at someone than it is to love them. And it's way more fun to just like, whatever. Anyway, the point to that is, is that the goal for us is to say, I should have stopped right then and say, God, I have a really bad attitude and I need you to start controlling my life instead of me. So that's the something. I want to read a story. We'll read it together. Bill Bright is the um, founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, and he shares this story, and we're going to actually just read it because I think it'll put another bow on what we're talking about. Here it says, I like to plan as far as in advance as possible, especially for key events, but occasionally I get so busy with the many details of our worldwide ministry that an important item slips through. With a key conference just a couple weeks away, I just realized the need for a set of printed materials that would be a tremendous benefit to the conferencees. As I shared the urgency with the department director responsible for this need, he responded, Bill, we're full up already. Two weeks just isn't enough time. I became impatient. Couldn't my associates see that we are in a war for men's souls, that we must seize opportunities when they arise and not limit our efforts to eight to five workdays? And I made my point clear to him. But if we had more notice, he protested, there is just no way we can squeeze in such a huge job with so little time. There's writing, design, typesetting, artwork, and printing. It seemed obvious that he did not share my burden for the upcoming event. I pressed my point. Look, this is an important international conference, I said firmly, my voice rising, and this is no time for business as usual. Please, find a way to finish this project in time for the conference, even if you have to work around the clock. I could tell my colleague was frustrated, but I reasoned, we need those printed materials. Whatever it takes, we need them. Within a few moments after our conversation, I sensed the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yes, even in our well-intended service to the Lord, we can stumble. And in the name of godliness, I had offended a dear brother. I had failed to give him and his staff the benefit of the doubt, failed to take into account the tough workload they already were facing. Instead of asking him to think through the possibilities with me and helping him rearrange his priorities to accommodate the new task, I had virtually ordered him to get the project done and shown little appreciation for the many late evenings his team was already devoting to the work. I had reacted impatiently rather than in a spirit of love, understanding, and teamwork. At this point, I had a choice to make. On the other hand, I could let it go. After all, doesn't the head of a large organization have the right to ramrod projects through when necessary? Didn't the end the strategic international conference justify the means, get the job done no matter what it takes? And didn't my associate's hesitant attitude warrant a stern talking to about the urgency of the hour? By all human standards, I probably could have justified letting the incident go. But deep inside, I would have been restless and uncomfortable as the Holy Spirit continued to point out the sin to me. And God would not have blessed my efforts on his behalf as long as the sin remained unconfessed. On top of that, several of my dear co-workers would have continued to hurt as a result of my calloused attitude. On the other hand, I could deal with the problem by taking scriptural action to clear the slate. 
The unrest in my conscience was the Holy Spirit cross-examining me as I tried to rationalize my behavior. What I had thought was forceful leadership, he was identifying as the sins of impatient and unjustifiable anger. I knew that taking scriptural action was the only choice I could make that would please my Lord. I confessed my sin to him and appropriated his forgiveness. Then the toughest part came. I drove down to the office complex where my associate and his team were located and asked for their forgiveness. We cried and laughed and prayed together, sensing a fresh outpouring of God's love in our midst. Then we talked through the mutual needs and found a way, as teammates, to rearrange priorities and accomplish the task on time. That is what the Christian life is all about, just keeping Christ on the throne. You do this when you understand how to walk in the control and power of the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit came for the express purpose of glorifying Christ by enabling the believer to live a holy life and to be a fruitful witness for our dear Savior. Here's what he said you should pray. Now as I begin this day and as I continue throughout the day, I invite you to walk around in my body, love with my heart, speak with my lips, and think with my mind. I thank you that you promised to do greater things through me than you did when you were here on earth. By faith, I acknowledge your greatness, your power, your authority in my life, and I invite you to do anything you wish in and through me today. I love that because it just gives you this idea of what that looks like. People struggle with us all the time. As Christians, we struggle with things like this. But the question is, does the Spirit of God convict us, and what do we do with that conviction? Do we just say, oh, I don't really care? Or do we say, do we have a heart that says, God, I really, really want to do what you want me to do? See, for Bill, he needed the Holy Spirit to give him patience and kindness. For you, you might, need, you might need the Holy Spirit to help you forgive your ex-husband. For you, it might need the Holy Spirit to help you walk away from that addiction or that sin. For you, you might need the Holy Spirit to help you stop being bitter or jealous or negative. For some of you, you might need the Holy Spirit just to give you the boldness to share Jesus with your neighbors and friends. We have that power We just have to realize that it's available to us. And it's available to us when we recognize our flesh is ruling our life and we ask God to remove our flesh and cover it with the Spirit. And believe it or not, he will. I have to tell you about a dream I had. I don't have, I I don't have dreams like, like if you live in the charismatic realm, some people will have dreams. I don't really have those. But I had this one and it was very, very vivid about, Two months before I start Bible study, I always have dreams, and this is how it starts. I walk in here. I realize I have not prepared a lesson. I have no idea what to teach. You're here. There's no tablecloths because I forgot to pick them up with the laundry. Uh, Juan forgot to actually set up the set. You're staring at me. I'm 30 minutes late, and I'm in this panic. So this is how my dream always starts. This particular dream was pretty much the same way it started, but there was something else going on in the background. My husband... Um, is friends with a guy whose wife goes here, and if I told you her name, you would all laugh at what I'm about to say, which I'm not going to say her name, but every one of you know her. So her husband's friends with my husband, and in my dream, her husband came to my husband and said, my wife is having an affair. And I heard about this and got to Bible study, and when I got here, along with all the chaos, I looked back, and here is this girl in the back corner with the guy she's having an affair with. And it's so vivid, and I just, I said, I'm done with this. I walk up to her, and I said, here's the deal. You want to have this affair? Have it. Live out of your flesh, whatever. There's consequences. You know it. My question is, do you love God more than you love your flesh? And that's the question. Do you love God more than, like, do you want to do what God's calling you to do, or do you want to do what you, to, and you're going to destroy your family? And she looked at me, and she started crying, and she turned to the guy, and she said, I can't have an affair with you because I love God more. And it was so vivid that I woke up the next morning, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to put this down in this because this is so important for us to really understand. Jesus says, if you love me, you're going to obey me. That's just what happens. But every day we have those choices. Am I going to live by the flesh or am I going to live by the spirit? If you never live by the spirit, then you need to really question yourself and say, am I really a Christian? And if you're constantly living by the flesh, say, all right, God, I think I'm a Christian, but what's my problem? God, you need to change the inside of me. And recognizing it's the first thing. I realize this. Here's our next screen. This is what you have to do. Recognize and pray. I realized this this summer. Um, if you live in Phoenix, Arizona, the only place you want to go in the summer is California, northern, uh, by the beach. So Rob and I last 
I don't know, March or something, we, we came upon this little place up in Northern California, and we've been so excited, just the two of us, no kids, no, it's just literally just us, we're going to get away. So I'm getting ready to hit the, the button that says we're going to reserve the place, and I realized, wait a minute, we're going July 14th, something's going on in July. So I realized we're having a grandchild, okay? <laughs> okay. And so being the good grandmother that I am, I called my son, and I'm like, Sean, when's the baby due? And he's like, July 12th. And I'm like, well, the 14th's cutting in a little close. We'll do the 16th, okay? Because babies, first babies never come late, right? Okay. So it's the 14th. Yep. No baby yet. So Rob has these business people come in, he and his wife, and we're, we're chatting. And she's telling us about how her mom is in early stages of Alzheimer's. And they must have walked out of the room, and Rob said, we need to give our trip to them. Okay. <laughs> I'm like... Trips paid for, tickets bought, you know. I'm praying that this baby, miraculously, that this baby will be born that night. So I have a bad attitude. Apparently I have a bad attitude a lot of times. <laughs> and I'm just like, Rob, like, we, I really want to go. And we, yeah, okay, you did all that, that thing. Anyway, so I told the lady, I said, here's the deal. I said, we have our, our tickets and everything, and we'll cancel them, but if she has the baby tonight or tomorrow morning, I said, then we'll go, because it's already there. But if she has it, you know, afternoon tomorrow, then we'll stay and you go. And this is what I said. So you pray that God, that she, uh, you pray that God, wait, how does that work? You pray that she doesn't have, wait, what is it? Has the baby? Doesn't have the baby? And I pray that she does have the baby. That's what it is. Yeah. I said, so you do, and we're going to see who God likes the most. Yeah. <laughs> So I got in my car, and I'm driving, and I said, God, please help Trisha to have the baby tonight. And then I realized how selfish I was. And I said, you know what, God, here's a woman who's with her mom, and it might be one of the last times that she has, and I am sitting here being a selfish, spoiled little brat, and I said, God, I know that, and I need you to change me. And I'm telling you what, by the time I got home 30 minutes later, my prayer completely flip-flopped. And I said, God, do not let Trisha have that baby tonight. And do not let Trisha have the baby tomorrow. I, I really desperately want this woman and her mom to go. And it's not anything I did. I didn't conjure it up. and make. It was honestly my true feeling. And it's because God changed my heart. And that's what happens when you ask God to take away your flesh and, do, and put the spirit more. How's that? We'll end here. Look at this last thing here. Lehman Strauss says this. We see a mighty unfolding in the book of Acts. Pow pagan powers are smitten. The lame are made to walk. The dead are raised to life. And thousands of souls are born anew. Never before were men possessed with so great an impulse to speak out for Christ. Never before had there been such readiness and voluntary willingness to suffer for Christ. Never before had a group so large known such enthusiastic and intimate fellowship. The world was to witness a new thing. Rather than deny Jesus Christ or each other, the disciples chose to take their lives into their own hands and go forward in Christ's, names, Christ's name, even unto death. They commenced their witness in Jerusalem, branching out to Judea and Samaria, and in due course, pushing out toward the uttermost parts of earth. And how did this new constraint come? There can be what one answer, the Holy Spirit, had come to abide. That is what's going on. When you and I become a Christian, that's what we should look like. But here's our problem. We don't. I'm saying that for me. I've just told you all my horrible things that I said and did this summer. And you're like, how could you even be a Christian? And it's like, ha, ah, you don't see much of that in me. Few Christians want to suffer. Few Christians want to share their faith. Few want to get involved. Few want to help. Few would ever think to die for Jesus. And we read Acts and we say there is such a disconnect between what is going on today in the church and what went on back then. And so the question I want to ask us as we leave is how do we get there? How do we get to where the early disciples were? And the answer is to understand the Holy Spirit and understand that there are two operating systems in our life that are fighting daily for control. And here's our choice. Romans 8, 6 says this, Now the mind of the flesh is death both now and forever, because why? It pursues sin. If you consistently pursue sin, you're going to feel like it's death. It's not good. We hear about these people that they just, the pastors, and we hear it all the time, the pastor just left his wife and but for the secretary and blah, blah, blah. You have all this and you're just thinking, that is death. Rob and I were talking about someone the other day that, that actually was in ministry and had an affair and all this stuff. And, and I, I used to see him in restaurants all the time. And I said, I bet he has to move. 
Because everyone knows him and knows what he did. And it's so, it's, it's just ruined everything. It's death. There's no life in that any longer. And that's what happens when we live out of our flesh. But the mind of the spirit is what? Life and peace. If you want to live a life and, life and peace, it's being run by the spirit. The spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God both now and forever. Flesh is destructive and spirit is life and peace. Here's our last verse, Romans 8 9. However, you are not living in the flesh, controlled by the sinful nature, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God lives in you, directing and guiding you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him and is not a child of God. If you have any doubts, please, this is not about a religion. This is not about anything like that. It's about your relationship with Jesus alone. Say, God, I am asking you to come in my life and take control. I don't want the flesh to run anymore. I want the spirit to. And that is where we are with the early followers. And next week, we'll pick up with Acts 5. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for, for what you're going to teach us through this. I pray, God, that we will walk out of here and we will recognize every moment of our day, who's running my life? Is it you, God, or is it my flesh? And I pray for every one of us that the Spirit of God will take over our lives so drastically that it will change us and we will be different people and we will be like the early church, witnesses, so people will want to come to know Jesus because of the way we live. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.